you do the empty chair thing. <laughs> well, what do you have to say? <laughs> Okay, so uh, we'll start the panel, and uh, again, uh, this is a panel on the question of the media, labor journalism, journalists, and the internet. And uh, in the, on the first point, as a result of uh, automation, technology, the internet, thousands of journalists have lost their job. There used to be labor reporters uh, in this country. Uh, there aren't many left, if at all. Stephen Greenhouse is in the New York Times, but most newspapers don't have a regular labor reporter. Uh, labor uh, journalists are lit, are, uh, have been cut back. Uh, they, most labor journalists in this country are independent journalists. They don't work for a publication, labor publication, and labor publications have been shutting down throughout the United States. Uh, and, but there is growing labor stories that are, on, that are going on, and in these times there are many labor journalists uh, who are working to get the story out, to break the information blockade. And also we have to examine how is labor covering itself uh, and the issues that labor is facing. Uh, one thing that makes exciting reporting is uh, both points of view, debate, discussion. And is labor going to do that so that people get excited about labor programming? So these are some of the issues that we want to address. So our first uh, speaker will be Steve Early, who's author, longtime labor. You mind journalist. if we switch it? Oh, to maybe let Paul go first. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So the the first speaker will be uh, Paul Burton. Paul is a journalist with the. Uh, San Mateo Labor Journal on the peninsula. He also is a member of the CWA, uh, Freelancers uh, Unit, and uh, has been covering labor stories for many years and is an activist, labor journal activist. So welcome, Paul. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm involved with the print side of journalism and the internet for us, it has positives and negatives. I've been the editor of the San Mateo Labor newspaper, published by the San Mateo Labor Council and Building Trades Council since 2004. I also write for the organized labor newspaper of the San Francisco Building Trades Council, and now I'm also the editor of The Journeyman, which is a newspaper published by the Alameda County Building Trades Council. So it's an interesting mix, and it's been interesting for me in the last eight years to see how we cover unions and labor from within the labor movement, from the Labor Council and Building Trades Council point of view. What are some of the issues that we interface with outside of labor, how we cover those. And in terms of the internet, um, and, and my, my personal history, I became an activist before Journalist. So most of the time when I, I started with Greenpeace also in 1979, my entree into journalism was selling advertising in the Greenpeace newspaper. From there I became an activist with Greenpeace and the environmental movement, the anti-nuclear movement. When I moved back to Southern California uh, in 79, 80, worked in the anti-nuclear movement, also writing about what's going on. So I've always had the activist uh, point of view and agenda even. When I came into the San Mateo Labor newspaper, I had covered labor issues for an alternative newspaper down in San Pedro, Random Lengths, which is one of the few, uh, one of the last of the independently owned alternative news weeklies in the country, really. It's a small newspaper serving San Pedro, but they cover <coughs> labor stuff there and they're very connected with the labor movement in LA. Um, but one of the things that I've, that I've found is when I came into the Labor Council world and the union world, I had some ideas of what I thought was missing and what I wanted to promote. Single-payer health care, uh, anti-war, linking the environmental issues, and also a labor party. And I found that the timing was good. Uh, Single-payer health care really started getting more support within the mainstream labor movement and the AFL-CIO since 2004. It's really built. Uh, same thing with the, in 2003, the labor movement was not on record against the Iraq war, but that has changed. Um, and with the links to environment and the climate change, even within the building trades, there's a lot of awareness about green building techniques, about uh, environmental issues and how that interfaces with labor and how that could be good for jobs to deal with sustainable building practices or to get involved with the environmental issues. There's coalitions being built. The real sticking point for me in my fourth agenda point that I had was, was a labor party because the the mainstream labor movement, as Steve knows and many of you know, there's 
still very much tied into the Democratic Party, and there's still a lot of you know Democrats that are very good with labor. They might not be good on every issue. So there's a lot of support, and it's hard to break through and push something in independent politics. But so my, my point of view is from an activist, how can I promote activism and links not just within labor, but outside into these larger issues and larger community? In terms of the internet, and then I'll hand it over to Steve, is just um, the internet has been good for us in many ways because it's enabled us to get content very quickly and easy. The California Labor Federation has a website with a blog. I can use their articles. I can have content that's already created for me. Same with the AFL-CIO blog that you mentioned earlier. So there's content there and those people that are writing it are generally union staffers who are being paid and I'm not exploiting you know, freelance writers to get content for my newspaper. Um, and on the negative side, as more and more people in the next generation get their news online, there's less of a demand for print, which is where our newspapers live. And they're actually, they're funded by subscription from unions who subscribe and produce a column for the newspaper. And then um, they pay a, a minimum rate, which covers the postage and the printing, barely. The problem we have now is our one union printer in San Francisco, the prints newspapers, just went out of business. They print probably every labor newspaper in the Bay Area, if not Northern California, if not California. So it's been a major hassle the last month trying to find another union newspaper printer or, or a union print shop that has the capability of printing newspapers. There's really only three that I know of that are in Sacramento. So it's been really tricky. And when I called to find out, well, what's going on? Why are you guys closing? The woman in the office said, well, you know, you don't see a whole lot of young people walking around carrying newspapers under their arm anymore. <laughs> and this generational shift is, you know, the print world is declining. As Steve mentioned, you know, newspaper journalists and San Francisco Chronicle or other major papers are being laid off. Then they're trying to survive as freelancers. And that's a, that's a tough world, which we can get into a little bit more after Mr. Hurley makes his comments. Great. Uh, let's do a quick survey. How many folks here currently or sometime in the past uh, have been involved in producing uh, a labor publication, whether it was a shop newsletter or uh, some web-based uh, publication, or writing about labor or workplace issues in any capacity? So pretty much everybody here has some form of labor journalism experience. Great. Um, I, uh, I want to thank Steve and Kazmi for the invitation and for putting together such a, a great uh, program as always. Um, I, I want to focus on the part of the uh, discussion this morning uh, about how labor should be uh, covered by the labor press and the never-ending struggle to kind of get our message across in the mainstream media. Uh, my own background is a, a little mix. I've kind of worn different hats. Um, like Paul, I was originally uh, a non-labor activist, very involved in the movement against the Vietnam War as a student in the late 60s. And uh, my first union work was actually on a, a, what was briefly a very unusual national union publication, the United Mine Workers Journal in the mid-1970s, when there had been a reform movement within the union. And for a brief two or three year period, we were able to do some very unusual things with the uh, coal miners newspaper in this country, which at that time had a circulation of about a quarter of a million. Hard to believe today, uh, since the active working membership of the UMWA is down to about 12,000. Uh, but back then, uh, this was a, a labor publication that had a broader reach in the coal fields. Uh, we would break investigative stories about uh, black lung, about uh, mine safety and health, about all kinds of issues affecting coal miners and their families. And mainstream newspapers like the Charleston Gazette uh, you know, would pick them up and treat them seriously and do follow-up reporting. So that was my first and rather unusual uh, experience with the official labor press. Um, I went on to spend three days decades as an international rep and organizer for the communication workers, mainly involved in strikes and organizing and contract negotiations, but during that time did help edit union publications for local union officers and stewards and often did workshops for people uh, in CWA about how to, how to deal with the media. Um, and I did some freelance journalism uh, on the side over the years uh, for local papers that, like the one Steve is familiar with, the Boston Globe back in Massachusetts and, and many others. I retired from CWA 
away five years ago. I've done a couple of labor-related book projects since then and have uh, had the luxury of being a full-time uh, labor journalist, which I would suggest uh, you not think about embarking on a career of doing unless you have a defined benefit pension and uh, <laughs> pre-Medicare Medicare age employer paid health insurance. Otherwise, it's a pretty tough road to hoe. We could talk more about that. And uh, so throughout this whole uh, period, I've also been very involved with labor notes. I uh, wanted to pass out a sample of that as uh, a 33-year uh, experiment in alternative or unofficial labor journalism. And uh, I'm sure some people here are familiar with it, subscribers and so forth. So I'd just like to offer a few comments on uh, the official labor press, which you know Paul uh, has already uh, talked a little bit about, the unofficial alternative labor press, both its uh, web and hardline uh, uh, incarnations, uh, the um, you know, how, how, how you break into the mainstream to the extent that's possible and uh, then also maybe, you know, where things are headed with left and liberal and uh, academic journals, which uh, actually are starting to take a little bit more uh, of an interest in labor than perhaps in the past. I think a number of people have touched on some of the problems with the official labor press. Um, you know, uh, notwithstanding the valiant efforts of, of folks like Paul and, and uh, many members of Steve Stallone's group, the International Labor Communications Association, you know, they're house organs, and uh, you really got to push the envelope for them to have the kind of lively content that, that C. Dunley was recommending, uh, to have them be more than kind of a family album for the officialdom, uh, for them to be uh, open to having debate, discussion, dissent, even letters to the editor column, word forbid, uh, and, uh, you know, kind of pro and con exchanges, much easier to have that kind of more freewheeling conversation about labor strategy strategy and debates uh, uh, in, in a publication like Labor Notes. Harder within an official uh, union uh, institutional setting. Though there are some honorable exceptions to that rule. The, the Dispatcher, which Steve Sloan is not here, used to edit. The ILWU has always had an unusual commitment to educating members about the history of their own union. They actually advertise books, encourage people to do reading beyond their own union newspaper. A lot of oral histories. They publish the work of well-known independent independent labor journalists like uh, Dave Bacon and others. Um, something that most union newspapers don't do, so I cite them as one kind of a positive example. Um, and, you know, uh, the problem is that even when they modernize, even when they overhaul and have a website, you know, I think you just heard it from Steve, he put it politely, I know there's not a lot of pizzazz there, it's still too much the official party line and, uh, you know, there's too much other stuff out there in the uh, in the internet to, to draw people's attention where there's interactivity and debate, discussion and criticism, self-criticism. You know, you go to the AFL website or many national union websites, you know, there's information, but there's, there's, uh, it's not as lively as it could be. So the unofficial labor press, uh, you know, if you worked on a shop floor newsletter, you know how controversial that can be. Um, you know, one of the best examples of somebody being a crusading rank and file voice, and I, I highly recommend people getting his book. He was here for Labor Fest, his brother Greg Shotwell, who for many years as a, as a working member of the auto workers, uh, published a newsletter called uh, Live Bait and Ammo. He's, he's now uh, uh, published a collection of his work with the help of Haymarket Press in Chicago. Uh, great example of somebody, uh, not a professional journalist, not a full-time union staff person, uh, not even a local union leader, but someone going to work every day in the auto industry and recording some very, very insightful uh, um, uh, pieces uh, publishing about what it's like and you know the changes in the industry and uh, uh, so I think that and in Canada uh, you know they Ledbetter is uh, here uh, you know there's a version of Labor Notes I think it's a little bit more establishment our times kind of a glossier monthly magazine um, you know has unions uh, publishing ads and sponsoring it to a greater degree than Labor Notes but I've been impressed over the years with our times his willingness to air uh, opposing points of view and run controversial articles and so forth. So there are some examples of people doing that and, and surviving. Uh, 
you know, if you're going to get your message across in the mainstream media, point number three, you got to be doing something. Uh, you can't just issue a press release. That's true of a local union, a national union, whoever. Uh, you know, the better coverage that we've been getting lately about whether it's immigrant workers or uh, the problems of people at Walmart or in food processing or fast food, why, why is that? Why are people paying attention to this? Well, we've had a whole strike wave of people who aren't even in established union bargaining units, and it's generated enormous amount of press coverage of uh, the underlying uh, workplace issues and concerns of folks who, uh, uh, you know, outside of Walmart, where there's some uh, significant support from the UFCW, have mainly been supported by the network of, network of, of worker centers. Um, you know, there's a couple of uh, places if you're trying to break into the uh, the mainstream media uh, to do opinion pieces for dailies. Uh, the Progressive Media Project, run by the Progressive Magazine in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, Other Voices, which is a, a new uh, an opinion service run by the Institute for Policy Studies. They're looking for younger people, uh, people of color, people uh, who, who don't have big names in journalism, who can write six or seven hundred page opinion pieces. You submit it to one of these. Uh, 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 op-ed services, uh, you know, the R equivalent of the ones that the, the conservative establishment has, has created and, and used to spread their message for years. And uh, if the newspaper chains that subscribe to PMP or other voices pick up your piece, you know, suddenly you're published in 10, 12, 13 different papers and you get 150 or 200 bucks. So if you're looking to break in as a new voice, as a, as a young journalist, want to write about labor or workplace issues or other communities issues, definitely check out Progressive Media Project and, and other voices. Um, again, you know, the unions, uh, not to belabor the point, who's been getting the best coverage lately, they're proactive, they're militant, they have a message, they do outreach to the community. Chicago Teachers Union uh, got terrific coverage of its uh, big strike recently because they laid the groundwork, they had a message, they had allies, and they had rank and file people, teachers, uh, speaking, not just, you know, full-time union officials and professional spokespeople. Same thing, too, I think of the, the message uh, sent by the two of the four largest strikes in the last 12 years, uh, last 12 months, uh, you know, which occurred here in California at Kaiser uh, last fall and this winter involving the California Nurses Association, NUHW, and some other union members at Kaiser, uh, you know, did a good job of linking the workplace complaints and issues to the issue of the quality of patient care at Kaiser, particularly in the area of mental health care. So, um, let me just close by saying that you know some of the traditional left liberal publications uh, in these times, The Nation, uh, Alternate, if you know that, you know they, they haven't always had a labor focus, but lately, you know they've gotten into labor blogging, and uh, in these times used to be a monthly publication. Now it's something called Working in These Times. A lot of people are breaking into labor journalism. Some great young writers, men and women, are now writing for Working in These Times. Alternate, uh, though the editor just left, a young woman named Sarah Jaffe. Uh, they have now set up kind of sub-site that just covers labor. Uh, the Nation, uh, you know, which I've been writing for on and off for, for more than 30 years, uh, now uses its uh, web edition to publish uh, great work by uh, young writers like Josh uh, uh, Idelson, who's been covering the, the Walmart strike wave. So uh, definitely the, the uh, online the, the onset of, of uh, web content has has made it harder for hard copy publications to survive. Whether it's a union newspaper, whether it's the printer who produces them, whether it's Labor Notes, whether it's the New York Times, but uh, you're attracting young readers and you're also providing uh, more space for young writers. So uh, on that note, uh, I would just say that uh, rather than just bemoaning, which we can do endlessly, how bad uh, labor is covered or not covered in the mainstream media, we have to do the kinds of things that people have been doing in this room for years uh, with labor video projects and video streaming and, and all kinds of uh, web-based initiatives, better websites, uh, and create our own alternative media outlets, our own vehicles for getting our our word out and message across. Thank you. But I, I want to follow up a little bit too on what you said and what you mentioned. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the what I think one of the best labor union websites is the California Nurses Association, and they've been very active and very good at promoting their work and also at having their members speak up. Um, and I think, you know, when I, like I said, when I started with the San Mateo la Labor newspaper, there were certain things that I thought were important for my readership to find out about. One, single-payer health care, which CNA was promoting, but AFL-CIO was not. 
but the timing was good because in 2005, Schwarzenegger attacked the nurses and they fought back. So this became a labor news story that we can't ignore, even though my newspaper is the official, uh, you know, media outlet for the for the. Um, San Mateo County Central Labor Council and the California Labor Federation, which the nurses were not affiliated with, but you can't deny that. You can't just be the mouthpiece of the internal, you know, unions affiliated with that labor council. There's other labor news going on. So it worked out good to be able to push the, what the nurses were fighting against in 2005 and also what they were pushing was single payer and I think it you know it's a responsibility of journalists who have some kind of activist background or have awareness of what's going on within and with and outside the labor movement to have an agenda and to have issues that we want to present to our readers and try to push the envelope if we can and eventually you know the trickle up kind of journalism that Amy Goodman talked about where you can get these issues up into the leadership ranks of the unions and of the labor councils to where they will hopefully listen and, and uh, there might be grounds for support from the rank and file. So there's a lot of issues like that. Uh, case in point, the Labor Federation in 2010 didn't take a position on Prop 19 to uh, tax and regulate cannabis in California. Um, but the UFCW, the United Food and Commercial Workers, was already organizing dispensary workers in, or in Oakland and elsewhere, and they've, they've really built up a unionized workforce within that industry, and now with the propositions in Colorado and Washington passing, there's movement in that direction, which is some an issue not necessarily seen as a labor issue, but it really is, and the, with the UFCW involved, the potential to really push that more. I think that's one thing, just a, one more quick comment, is it, it ties in with your comment about the younger generation of journalists and, and activists. There's the citizen journalists and activist journalists attached to the Occupy movement. Many of the demonstrations I went to, pretty much every demonstration I went to in Oakland, there were folks with the uh, iPhones and the iPads and cameras doing the live streaming, and many of them were not trained journalists, but they learned on the fly, and they had an activist point of view, and they were able to get the word out and have the participants in these demonstrations tell their stories. In, in Oakland in particular, very strong links with labor, with the port shutdown and other actions that were that went on against school closings. and. So there, there is a group of young people that are tech savvy that can that are also interested in labor. The trick is, how can they survive and make a living? You know, through the freelance workers union that the CW, CWA now has, or the Pacific Media Workers Guild here in San Francisco. There is support, and there is a, a very affordable dues that give you access to, to pretty cheap. Um, dental health insurance and working on a, a group plan for health insurance and there was also the, the move towards um, setting freelance standards so that you're you know you can make union scale at least as a freelance writer and a freelance photographer freelance journalist so there is support for that for the Pacific Media Workers Guild but I don't think a lot of the young citizen journalists are aware of that yet and that's something that I know Steve Stallone is also involved with it might you don't want to promote, but um, um, should, should we take a nap? Well, one, I was going to make a, a couple of points. One of the things is that uh, the AFL-CIO and the unions are doing stuff in the media. They are using social media, uh, and we've seen this weekend a very powerful uh, effect that the online campaign of the Walmart workers, Respect, has had where they've been able to use social media and others to get their story out, you know, and reach out to workers who are unorganized and tell their stories. So, but uh, as far as labor having a labor media strategy, that doesn't exist. Now, every big corporation in the world, every big multinational has a department for media. They spend billions of dollars for developing a media strategy, a media <coughs> campaign, how they're going to tell stories, how they're going to organize to get their stories out, how they're going to get on the internet. The labor movement doesn't have the money to compete with these multinationals as far as a budget, but it does have labor. 
It has workers, and it also has workers who do this as a profession. Writers, it has videographers, uh, the, the media unions, CWA and other media unions, there are IATC, IVW, these are the workers that produce media. So there has to be a, the development of a labor media strategy in the AFL-CIO on how to bring all these different struggles together and get them out in a popular way. And that's why our local has supported the idea of a labor channel. A national labor channel, and we should try. And the AFL-CIO is going to be having their national convention uh, in September in Los Angeles. We should try to get a groundswell of unions, all the unions within the labor movement, saying we need a labor channel. We need these journalists who are writing about these stories to be on a channel. Josh Edelson, all the different writers around the country could be interviewed uh, about the issues that are facing workers. Uh, today, we're facing an attack on this grand bargain that's being talked about with Obama and the Republicans, in which they're talking about attacking entitlements. Uh, well, they're already, Obama's already attacking entitlements because he wants another payroll tax on Social Security. But what is that going to do? That's undermining Social Security. If you don't pay into Social Security, which this payroll tax means, it means your, the, uh, your, the income of Social Security is declining. What the labor movement should be doing is saying, we want to remove the cap on Social Security. So the millionaires pay more than $108,000. But that's a non-issue in this whole campaign to defend Social Security. This is uh, like a proactive agenda that we need in labor. Not just saying stop the attacks, but who should pay the cost of this crisis. We're not seeing that in, in labor media. The other thing is what, we're, what we've done in our, our local again is we've said that our national convention should be streamed live. Now Kosatu in South Africa, their convention is live. They bring in speakers uh, from all over the world and from on issues to these national conventions. Why should the members and other people be able to watch them? These speakers. I mean, we spend millions of dollars. The unions spend millions of dollars on their conventions. The big national unions, CWA, uh, IAT, uh, I mean, uh, uh, SEIU. I mean, all these unions spend millions of dollars, and they actually videotape their conventions. But it's only for the people who go to the convention. Well, I say the members have a democratic right to see their conventions. They're paying for the conventions. Why should they be able to see and hear the debates, if there are any? And there have been debates at the past SEIU convention. There are debates, and, and, and hopefully we need more debates. The reason uh, that people are interested in going to a video is because there's debate, there's discussion. Not because everybody votes together the same way, but you actually have a controversy and discussion. That makes interesting uh, articles, it makes interesting television, and you have a debate and discussion, and we have debates in the labor movement. Why they don't do that? So, well, there's a fear that if you have a debate and discussion, uh, you know, that'll be, be controversial. You know, if you show different points of view, that'll be controversial. I say the working people in this country need to have those controversies in front. We need to have a discussion and debate in a serious way with different points of view. People have different points of view. They have uh, different opinions. Let's have a debate and discussion so people can learn from those debates and discussions. I mean, we need a democratic communication movement in labor and more uh, dem democracy in the labor movement so these debates and discussions can be taken forward, which they're not really being taken forward. Uh, and that's another aspect of it. So uh, the other thing is that this last election cycle, the union spent probably $300, $400 million dollars uh, on mostly the Democrats, Obama. They have now a Democratic Congress in California. They have a Democratic-controlled legislature. Uh, but how much money do they spend on labor journalists? How much money do they spend on their own independent media to get their story out of the longshoremen, of the teachers, of the nurses? Very little of that is going into labor telling its own story. And there was a time in this country when labor had radio stations in Chicago. Uh, there's a, and one of the other things that were, I think is important is that uh, when Workers Independent News is putting forward a proposal for an, a labor application, a labor app on your iPhone. So you go to the labor app, which is free, and then you can get any program, any labor program that exists in the country. There are labor programs in, in Wisconsin, in New York, in Dallas, there's a program here, Work Week. there are many different labor programs. Why shouldn't that be easily accessible on your smartphone? So you can do a live interview, and you can get it through an app. 
which is a very important vehicle using communication technology. So that's another tool. But I think we, uh, labor journalists, people who want to cover the labor issues, uh, need to get a movement going within the labor movement, within unions, that this is a priority. We're not going to be able to beat the attacks on us by these corporations by keeping our stories silent or not allowing our stories to get out, and that's a critical task. So, uh, Steve Donnelly. Yeah. Uh, to the point about funding labor journalists, uh, my company is about to announce a new service. Why don't you come up here? Uh, uh, sure. Okay. And David, if you want to come from Canada? No? Okay. We've, we've got a Canadian labor activist here who can talk about Canadian Canadian labor movement. That's, so that's an important part of Okay. Yeah. So uh, we're starting a new service called uh, labormail.org, and it's just a simple email hosting service. And uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear. No, no, that mic is only for the camera, That's okay. so we don't have mic. Yeah. So okay. you have to speak loud. Okay. Um, so uh, labormail.org is a new service that we're starting. Uh, it, there's going to be a charge of one dollar per email address per month and local unions will be able to have uh, us host their email you know just as you get uh, email through Gmail and Yahoo uh, you'll also be able to get your mail online through our service uh, what we're going to do for every 1000 addresses that we host uh, we're going to donate $250 to a particular labor journalist every month mm -hmm. and so uh, you know we want to grow and host as many email addresses as possible uh, we're going to be announcing that Mike Elk is going to be our first recipient uh, you know, of the $250 per month. He needs month. the money. Uh, yes, he's broke. <laughs> and, and, and so, uh, you know, hopefully this will take off and it will be an avenue for at least some labor journalists to support their work so they can go, you know, take flights to conferences and, and support themselves, uh, you know, in their important work. Because it's really, you know, really why I build websites. My dream was to help unions do their own journalism. It never happened. I was kind of naive about that. Uh, but really, that's what unions need to be doing is, is writing their own uh, content, putting it out there, and engaging with the community and sharing what they know with uh, the wired community. So, so what is this service going to do? Uh, labormail.org. So you know what Gmail is, Yahoo. It's the same thing. Yeah. So you you so but your union instead of hosting with some non-union outfit, uh, they'll be able to host with us. They'll be able to you know have a unionized uh, you know server, and and my employees are uh, members of UE, and they'll also uh, you know help labor journalism, and we're probably cheaper too. Why don't you come up here? Oh, no, I just want to raise a question. Um, I want to ask, like, there's a lot of collective experience here. How do you explain the, the very closed atmosphere about it in the media, in the labor media, as it used to be called, those sort of things? And, and I, you know, I've struggled with this issue. I'm involved in the labor studies program in Canada. And I like to touch labor control for fear uh, in the program for fear that it will close down debate among young students and others trying to explore issues. In my opinion, part of the antidote is that unions have to have constitutional changes and protections mm -hmm. for dissent in their own right and to develop a respect for debate, a culture of, of, of reflection <coughs> as well as united action, you know, an open, open reflection combined with we need to have two. And, and no, but the issue for me is why, and why does it continue? The Cold War is many years past. Um, I know people need jobs, and there's always a struggle with oil within the unions. That will probably continue for a long time. But there seems to be this lack of dynamic that open debate to Canada too is a good thing. You know, that we really need to have media that reflects different points of view. You don't have to be personally loyal to any particular leader. You can be loyal to a union and to the working class as a whole, with, and still dissent. And you know, you've got lots of experience. I'd really like to hear why you think it's happening and continues to happen. In some unions, I would say today, it's even worse as the contradictions get sharper within the capitalist system as a whole. Uh, I could answer that because I get all the 
I get the teachers newspaper, I get the ILWU, I get the IVW, I get all the labor newspapers pretty much in my office. And they're all basically, you know, for lack of a better term, propaganda, pro-union, pro our local, you know, outreaching to their members. And so they want, I think, to recruit more people and make people feel good about being in the union. And they talk about the victories, they talk about the struggles, even something that we might consider you know, a loss, like, okay, we just signed a concessionary contract that's not quite as bad as the one that we signed three years ago. That's portrayed as a victory. And I think it's because, you know, the unions have been under attack for so long and union membership percentage of the workforce has declined for so many years that it's a defensive mode and it's trying to put that positive word out there. A personal issue that I had in my paper is that I had a piece of news from the AFL-CIO that I printed about, actually, ironically, about the printer that in San Francisco that just went out of business when they switched their affiliation in the press room from uh, an independent graphics workers union to the Teamsters. And the, at that point, the Teamsters were fil still affiliated with the AFL-CIO in 2004. And their news was like, this is a great thing. And I put a couple paragraphs on there and got an angry call from the head of the, of the graphic workers union hey, that, that's not true, you know, that was a really close vote and we felt like we were under attack and, and we have a lot of people that are not happy about the Teamsters coming in. But that wasn't something that was debated in my newspaper or within the Labor Council. And part of it is wanting to have unity. The San Mateo Labor Council actually is a pretty good model of really good, strong unity among a diverse group of unions, building trades, airline unions, um, public sector unions, private sector unions, there's a lot of unity around you know, certain issues, around most issues, and they want to foster that. And I think you know, that's part of it, is like putting the positive, positive news out there to the membership to keep building up the union and protecting it and not leaving it open to further attack. Well, I want to uh, focus on the question of uh, the need for you know structural or union constitutional change, which is obviously not e easy to achieve. And, and this may seem like an old case study, but it is uh, the 40th anniversary this month of the Miners for Democracy uh, victory in, in 1972 in the Coal Miners Union. Um, you know, they started out with a, a leg up that many of us don't have in our unions. There was a referendum vote, and every member got to vote for the top offices of the union. So three rank and file coal miners ran against the top officials of the union and uh, because uh, they were part of a broader insurgent movement uh, they made labor history they knocked off full-time uh, international union officials and moved directly from jobs as working members to the, running the headquarters in Washington DC one of the unusual circumstances right off the bat one of the abuses of the old regime uh, headed by a guy named Tony Boyle who was a murderer basically and conspired to kill uh, a dissident who had dared to challenge him a few years before was the abuse of the union paper, the Mine Workers Journal. It was like, you know, full of oil propaganda uh, to the point where there was some Landon Griffin litigation about that and the dissidents, when they ran in 1972, were able to get some equal time mailings. Well, at the 1974 Mine Workers Convention in Pittsburgh, the reform movement, you know, already fracturing and floundering, did succeed in changing the UMW Constitution to uh, uh, establish uh, a tradition which continues to this day of battle pages. So whenever there are elections for the National Executive Board and the top officers, uh, all candidates get space in the National Union publication. Now you might think, well, what's so radical about that? Well, you can count the number of unions who uh, guarantee opposition candidates this right in the U.S on one hand, right? Uh, the Teamsters are another example. It was kind of imposed on them. But that's a simple, hard to achieve, but important structural change incorporated in the union constitution so that when you have contested union elections, hopefully have some contests, uh, you know, the folks who don't have the advantages of incumbency get some airtime, right? The problem is the culture of our unions here is so totalitarian. I mean, at the Teamsters, for example, uh, Candidates, once they're nominated, and I saw this in Las Vegas last year, not only get space in the union publication, they get to speak, right? So at the Teamsters in Las Vegas last summer, uh, 3,500 delegates, half of the longtime incumbent gets nominated, two candidates, 
running against them get nominated. Both of them end up getting 40% of the membership vote. So they were not marginal people. Once the members got to vote, they you know, had significant support. When they made their statements, 3,000 Hoffa delegates walked out of the convention. The audience was reduced to the 300 delegates who uh, supported Fred uh, Daguerre and, and Sandy Pope. So <laughs> you, can't, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Right? So even when you've democratized on paper, or in the Constitution, or in the election rules, the structure, in a way that you know, doesn't exist in most other unions, though AFSCME had a pretty good candidates debate at its uh, National Officer Election Convention uh, earlier this year, um, you know, it's, it's okay for the incumbent basically to encourage his supporters to walk out and not even listen you know, to what the, the other candidates have to say. And, you know, I don't know what they do when they get their Teamster magazines with the battle pages. Maybe they just throw them away. But at least, you know, there, there's an institutionalized mechanism for having some kind of debate uh, and exchange of views, at least in the context of uh, a national union elections when they are contested. So, I, I, you know, I think we need more examples like that at the local level. Might be more achievable there. Reform your local bylaws to provide similar... Uh, equal time opportunities when somebody's running for local president. They've got to have equal time uh, for candidate statements in the paper or in what's sent out to the voters and in a candidate's forum where you can hear from everybody who's running. What, one of the uh, issues uh, is requiring debate. I mean, we just had this national election. All other candidates except the Democrat and Republican were excluded. The Green candidate, I mean, it's, it's like they had many of the same positions on war, on uh, U.S. and the Middle East and every place else. So there wasn't a real alternative. So a requirement in our constitutions that if there's an election, th there's, a re there's a requirement that there be a debate. If you want to run for office of a president, you have to be in a debate. And, and it should be televised, it should be on stream so people can watch it. I mean, national conventions, that would be a good thing to have a debate where people can have a discussion, different points of view. It would have a, open up the unions for a real discussion and debate, which is, I think, lacking in most unions. Marcus? Um, I'm, uh, I mean, one, I just, I just wanted to, to say that as far as the dispatcher, I'm in the aisle of you, little Tim. I mean, that's the way the dispatcher used to be. I don't, I don't view it. I mean, Stone was like, he's been removed from the dispatcher over. Yeah. No, that reference was past tense. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> now, and this is in relationship to, to this, to this discussion too. Just as far as using, say, what the dispatcher, what what's happened, you know, like within say the past year or so in the dispatcher in relation to ship to the struggles that went down like with local 10 like we shut down the port um in support of the wisconsin market. and there was in the dispatcher there was one sentence about that and the head the headline and the whole front page was about la having this kind of like feel good rally in support of wisconsin workers and then the shutdown of of the port of oakland you know was relegated to one sentence in the middle of the whole thing, and we were lucky to get that. And then, um, then uh, in relationship to the EGT and the shutdowns with uh, with Occupy, Good, how are you? there was a, a big feature letter to the editor of, of basically a member here attacking people that that were that were um, in support of Occupy and. You know of, of, of that relationship um the occupy shut down 40,000 people came to shut down the port of Oakland in in support of uh, i love you local, local i mean uh, uh struggle up in in um in longview washington against a non-union um brainer and and so that and, and i feel like it's it's to the point of what you were talking about is that i feel like that the unions you know, and in the U.S., I think it's partially a result of like the whole McCarthy era and, and that, that that the people that are real fighters got removed from the leadership. But basically, I feel like that the union leadership looks at these you that they are they, the unions are about controlling the work, and that they don't. That's part of why there isn't debate in there. Is that they don't they they they're they're very afraid, and they and, and one of the big things they do is is keep any any kind of like 
rank and file, um, you know, movements um, in real, real fire. Damn, that, that that they see that as their role, and I feel like that's why there there is a debate because 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 it goes to the heart of that that the debate you know is the rank and file like saying you know like like coming forward. So. So I I mean. So I had a personal experience and it's not anything, I'm not trying to be controversial or anything, but I know in the NUHW thing and the SCIU battle that Kaiser held such a big deal in terms of democratic and so on and so forth. So I had a personal, and I'm not trying to advocate for one side or other, but I was on the steward council at Kaiser prior to the trusteeship and where the people who were there prior to beat the trusteeship wouldn't allow any topics about SEIU or even the notion of are they a good thing, are they a bad thing? Had people resign without knowingly as stewards, um, without prior to SEIU being tr uh, trusting the local, um, had people resign just um, sending these letters without people even knowledge of them being resigned as shop stewards. So it's kind of like. In both sides, they use the same tactics of shutting people out and not letting people voice, figure out what actually what side is better. So it's kind of like, I kind of feel divided in the sense of a lot of internal union movements where are quote unquote reform against, you know, like, you know, factors that are not, not also good for workers, but at the same time, they use the same tactics to try to get people to buy into it. And I can only speak on the NUHW SEIU thing where I saw the same thing, NUHW was doing the same thing, SEIU t red t-shirts, not even letting you ask questions about what SEIU is going, or anything to actually like, let people make a real judgment on what's good and what's bad. So it's kind of like, kind of like stuck in the struggle of the debate thing. Cause I feel like I've seen both sides in a lot of instances are the same, it comes out being the same thing. Well, the, the the purges that happened in the in the 1940s and, and 50s of the trade union movement in the United States basically destroyed those militants, socialists, communists, activists who built the unions in the 1930s. In other words, the mass union movement in the 1930s was built by a mass movement of occupations, of general strikes, of a mass mobilization of working people in this country. And what happened in the purges was, and the formation of the AFL-CIO, was a movement towards a corporate form of unionism, business unionism. The actual formation of the AFL-CIO came together as a result of a purging of left-wing unions, like the ILW and other unions. That's what happened in the formation of our unions, AFL-CIO. So the structure, what happened in the structure is the unions that were uh, for, uh, came together wanted a corporate type structure supporting American capitalism, not just in this country, but internationally. Uh, that was what happened. And the unions today are, uh, I would say, not democratic generally. Uh, the, the officers or the staff are appointed. You don't have elected staff. Uh, in unions it, for the most part. Some you do, but in most cases the staff are, are appointed by the top officials. So you don't have rank and file control of the staff and you don't have a democratic structure whereby you can have debates, democratic debates at national conventions. Debates are, you know, you know debates are, are looked upon as a problem. Uh, not as something that we want to have a debate and discussion and see what, what happens uh, to clarify that. So the whole orientation of the labor movement in general is we don't want to have an internal struggle. I mean actually Andy Stern and the Change to Wins people said they wanted to have a debate in the labor movement. We want to have a debate and they got a lot of people, we need a debate in the labor movement. How come we're losing members? How come the percentage of workers is declining? This is how they approached the PR anyway at that time. And what happened was people, a lot of people said, yes, let's have a debate. Let's have a discussion in the labor movement. Then what they did is they walked out of the AFL Sarah Convention. We we're going to, we're finished with you. We're going to have our own, uh, our own organization. And actually, uh, it is, has to be said that the change to win, even though it's not up front, uh, the organizing of the uh, fast food workers in New York and this Walmart campaign are by uh, non-AFL-CIO. It's the change to win people who did that. But the reality was that there was supposed to be a debate and it was cut short by the splitting of, of the AFL-CIO. I think, though, that 
with the internet and media now, it is possible to have a discussion and debate and to force these issues so there can be a debate in the labor movement. There needs to be a debate. Uh, but I agree, tactics have been similar in many cases and we have a, a real structural change in the labor movement that requires uh, a real battle for a democratic trade union movement to confront the issues facing us. Um, and that's something that's ongoing. Um, but, you know, I think we need more debates. I mean, well, just to follow up real quick, because that debate in 2004 was around with SEIU, UFCW, laborers, teamsters that wanted to split off from the AFL-CIO was around prioritizing organizing over funding election campaigns and that's the, really the debate I think that didn't happen at that time and maybe some of the change win unions have been more effective in organizing and pushing that. Some of them have also come back into the AFL-CIO so I don't know if that debate is you know, really happening or not or still needs to happen. Some hands in the yeah. back. Yeah. In the back. Well, um, I, I think this this whole issue relates more than anything else in my mind to the difference between uh, advocating for society that the rank and file does a much better job than the leadership does at almost every union I've ever been part of or witnessed. So I think that's the crux of the issue. Uh, there will always be some dissent in unions and more authoritarian the leadership, the less, uh, the fewer opportunities there will be to express that dissent. But I'd like to mention something else if I can. Uh, I would like to see in the future workshops uh, emphasizing or directing us to the importance of literacy in the movement. Uh, because we have two good examples this morning, and Noel and, and Danny and other people who have spoken have been very smart, very well informed, and one of my favorite quotations is, literacy is bringing the, the knowledge of the world into individual lives, and certainly that's as, as, as high a priority than the, in the labor media, it's in the, the, the higher priority than in the general media, the mass media, I think, but the, I, I think we need to encourage people more to read as often as possible and write as often as possible, because the the best presenters in almost in, in the mass media and the labor media are people who read a lot and who write a lot. And I think we we forget that many times. And we, 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 we live in, a, in an instantaneous world of, of still photography and, and video and film. And I believe that if we do a better job of preparing people are encouraging people to read as much as possible and to write as much as possible, we will have a much more compelling message. <coughs> Uh, well, one comment, then we're going to have to go to Tom Ladd is here from the UAW National Writers Union. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's an excellent point, I, and I, I think uh, you're right to make a distinction between uh, literacy and active literacy. I mean, there are some uh, unions, uh, many SEIU janitors, uh, locals, uh, negotiate for uh, paid time off for members to take ESL classes. I mean, they're they're helping people in a way that expands their, their job skills sometimes and their employability, uh, you know, to read and write. Right. But um, that's about as far as a lot of unions go, including unions that are very involved in uh, promoting literacy skills like the teachers, right? If you go, and I don't want to just kick them around as, as we've been doing all day, I guess, for their real and imagined shortcomings, but if you go to the national website of the American Federation of Teachers, there's one book that's recommended for members of this union with hundreds of thousands of public school teachers who teach reading and writing, and it's a biography uh, glowing, of course, of Albert Shaker, the, you know, the old president. Oh, yeah. Now, you know, again, at least the United Electric Workers, the ILWU, uh, even now, encourage members to read a broader range of labor histories, usually with more of a left-wing slant. But, uh, you know, my old union, CWA, uh, outside of the Newspaper Hill part of our website, which does do book reviews, doesn't deal with, uh, you know, uh, any of the new books uh, of which there are quite a few that, that uh, have come out in the last few years about various workplace trends and problems and labor issues, controversial and sometimes not so controversial, uh, even when it affects workers in their core jurisdictions, like uh, the public sector, the telecom, healthcare, the airlines industry. And so this kind of blinder and this, uh, uh, you know, unwillingness to help try to, in a small way, recreate a culture of union member and working class 
active literacy, people kind of reading books that relate to their lives, maybe about some aspect of their work life, might give them some ideas about political economy, history, labor culture, and so forth, uh, is a real serious shortcoming, notwithstanding the great work of many labor editors and labor educators. And, and we should also point out that the labor studies programs that exist are threatened. Uh, the San Jose Community College, the San Francisco City College uh, programs are all threatened with being shut down, uh, uh, targeted uh, on the budget cuts uh, as an excuse to close down these, and ethnic studies departments as well are being threatened as well, which is a history of working people and ethnic communities. So the literacy that you're talking about in at least labor studies and ethnic studies is also being threatened now in the United States. Uh, but we have a, another speaker who was, uh, I guess, late due to the storm here in Northern California, Tom Ladd, but he did arrive and we'll give him a little bit of uh, time to, to, to speak. If you want to introduce yourself. Oh, you, know, you can just... Yeah, okay. okay, this is... Uh, the my disorder, okay. Uh, I can't believe this is... Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, it's a very pleasure to be a great Okay, this is not for the mic, so yeah. you don't need to. Right. You can just normally. <laughs> well, I want to say thank you to Steve and, and Cosme for uh, inviting me, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm here with the National Writers Union. Uh, we're affiliated with the UAW, the Auto Workers, and we are a labor union, the nation's only labor union specifically for freelance writers. We have a different bit of a bit of a different model in that we're all generally independent contractors, as technically known. So we don't have the same rights to collective bargaining that workers and other unions tend to have. Uh, for example, specifically members of unions such as the Newspaper Workers Guild and, and the CWA, um, they have rights uh, to, to bargain collectively, as do uh, the, the Writers Guild of America. Um, but not freelance writers uh, such as ourselves. And that is actually one of our organizing points in that we support legislation to allow collective bargaining for independent contractors. And that's, I find that very significant because it would apply not just to freelance writers, but people in other industries that have been traditionally denied organizing rights uh, based on this nominal status of being an independent contractor. Um, the, the most famous examples are farm workers and domestic workers who've always been denied those rights. And you might not know it, but technically it's because they're considered independent workers. And so, and that would in be considered, if they were to get together collectively to create a union, that's considered a violation of U.S. antitrust laws, which is sort of a historical travesty, which we've addressed in other forms, I'm sure. Um, but so I, I'll, I'll give you a brief uh, outline of some of our, our key organizing points and our some of our, our, our main points and our strongest areas. Uh, one is our grievance and contract division. When you're a freelance contractor, what you end up usually uh, getting as a business model is uh, a contract with a publisher. And so you are... Uh, you agree on a contract and you sign it and the publisher is supposed to agree to it. Our, our divisions exist in, to help you get advice on that contract. You can get counsel from professional contract workers who have been in the industry for a long time, several decades in many cases, and they will help you create the contract that is best uh, in your best interest. And then, should you have a grievance, if you are abused or otherwise, uh, or you, your publisher refuses to pay you, then uh, we have our, our grievance division uh, who will give you advice and stand by you as you campaign to get your fair compensation and your grievances redressed. Uh, we are also working on what we call the Pay the Writer campaign, which grew out of the Huffington Post uh, boycott of uh, just last year. You might have heard of that when Ariana Huffington sold her Huffington Post for $400 million around there uh, and also got a $4 million a year sal salary as the technically the content manager, uh, which is very ironic because all m most of the people who write for the Huffington, Huffington Post are not paid a dime. They are all volunteer writers. 
And that is specifically what they agree to when they submit stories. Now, you might ask, why would anybody write for somebody like Ariana Huffington in a famous journal if you're not going to get paid? And the answer is, well, you get free exposure. And this is mainly aimed at new writers, students, for example, graduate students. And it promises them <coughs> national exposure in a well-read journal for their name, their byline, uh, in exchange for unearned, unpaid labor. Uh, and because um, the many writers felt that, well, Ariana just made $400 million off of our unpaid work, and nobody was given a bonus, nobody was giving in any compensation at all, this created an awareness that perhaps, indeed, they're being exploited. And so they, there was a group got together, uh, a, a, the Bloggers and Writers Committee, and the National Writers Union joined them uh, and helped uh, to start organizing them, as did the CWA. And what came out of that was a boycott of Huffington Post by the writers, wherein bloggers and writers were encouraged not to submit anything to the Post until these discussions about compensation and fair payment were resolved. And the boycott continued for some time. The last uh, news uh, that we have on it was that the Huffington Post and the communication workers got into discussions about resolving this, and so the boycott was called off. But out of this, our own union created uh, the Pay the Writer campaign, wherein any publisher that is not compensating writers, freelance writers for their work, um, can be uh, redressed uh, by members in our union. As examples of that, we have two magazines, um, which are lesser known. One is called Heart and Soul Magazine, uh, which, and the writers there, uh, about 20 of them have not been paid for the last several years of unpaid labor. And that's a magazine directed toward the health uh, and um, family issues of black women, and the, the writers are primarily black women. So there are 20 women there who have not been paid several thousand dollars uh, of, of work that they had been promised. And so we're representing them, and uh, we filed various suits in support of them. Many of them have joined our union, and uh, the, the company has promised actual compensation to some of them. Um, and so we are looking forward to uh, victories on that front. And we also have another magazine called Natural Solutions, where several dozen writers were denied uh, several hundred thousand dollars in compensation. And we just obtained a, f a promise to, to compensate all of them in full. Now, of course, and that was in uh, November, uh, on November 12th. Um, now, of course, only one of these writers has been compensated anything. But that's m one more than uh, had been paid uh, before we got involved. And we have a, a promise from their, their legal department that they will compensate all the authors. We, uh, and, um, I wanted to go back to that idea of collective bargaining rights uh, because I think that uh, labor tech uh, and the other events that have been organized, such as Labor Fest, uh, to bring workers and labor organizations together, um, I think will be definitely helped when we start opening up this discussion about collective bargaining um, because considering that the labor union models that we understand came out of the organizing of the 30s, uh, that mass movement that Steve was referring to, um, this the, it created the power for labor unions through collective bargaining. And uh, the powerful unions such as the UAW um, with their sit-down strikes and uh, the general strikes, for example, with the ILWU, um, gave unions the power to uh, obtain contracts for good, benefits and wages and, and good working conditions which were unprecedented in this country and around the world before that movement started. Now, with the collective bargaining, considering that uh, when we're talking about the, the new uh, business model, such as Walmart, where workers are, are paid little, very little for their work and have no job guarantees, no health guarantees, when a campaign such as the Organize Our Walmart arises, which you, we just saw, uh, with all the, the inspirational workers from Walmart uh, getting together and, and demonstrating on Black Friday. Um, they received support from unions all around the country. 
And um, one of the key demands is that the, the union be recognized. And this goes to the heart of the, the union struggle because in order for the workers to have their interests defended, they need to be able to bargain collectively in uh, their organization such as the labor union, and the union must be recognized. So uh, the National Writers Union is working to support legislation in Congress that will indeed recognize the rights of freelance writers and workers around this country to organize and defend their interests in labor unions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're close to wrap up. We'll take a couple more questions, then we want to have a summary session. Janet and then Steve, did you just have a well, um, At KPFA, there's a situation where there are unpaid workers on the staff. Most of the staff, and Well, I mean, I, in, in general, I mean, on the issue of uh, what's happening by the capitalist agenda is to make everybody an independent contractor. That's the plan. Uh, cab drivers in San Francisco used to be unionized. They said, well, you can't unionize anymore because you're an independent contractor. <coughs> Truckers used to be organized more, and they, every trucker now is an independent contractor. So the capitalists and the corporations, without any opposition really political campaign, have made millions of workers independent contractors who have no health care, who have no benefits, and are pretty much on their own. So what happens is, if you're an independent contractor and you get injured on the job, like cab drivers in San Francisco do, you're out of luck. You go to general hospital, you beg for money so you can have operations. Uh, so it's cost shifting for the public uh, to have to pay for their costs. Uh, but there's no political campaign to eliminate this whole scam of making everybody an independent contractor uh, that's going on in this country. Um, I would say that, uh, <coughs> that everyone should be able to be in a union. Let me give you an example. In Sweden, at a previous uh, conference of labor tech, we had a panel on organizing in Europe. And in Sweden, for example, uh, at Toys R Us, they tried to organize, they, tried, they brought in a Toys R Us. Under the Swedish labor law, uh, if one worker wants a union, the company has to sign a contract with them. So one worker at Toys R Us said, I want a union. I want a contract. They said, no, 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 we're not going to give you a contract. Well, the workers in Sweden said, no more products from Toys R Us coming to this store. They blockaded all the supplies going into Toys R Us from going to the store. Sweden had to sign a contract, or Toys R Us had to sign a contract with this worker. Uh, otherwise, they couldn't get their supplies. Well, workers should have the right to have a contract, a union. In this country, workers who want a union are fired. 10 to 20,000 workers are fired every year uh, who fi then file charges with the NLRB who want a union. But uh, as to the CWA and, and UE, the uh, KPFA used to be covered by a UE contract, all workers, paid and unpaid. During the uh, takeover attempt that was moved, uh, the workers voted <coughs> to have uh, covered by the CWA. There was a struggle in the court ruled paid workers, paid workers. Uh, the court ruled that, <coughs> that the unpaid staff were not entitled to coverage by the union. That's what, what the NLRB court decision. <coughs> Excuse me, but I believe every worker, whether they're paid or unpaid, should be able to be in a union and be organized. And the unpaid workers could join unions like the IWW and other unions. They're unions they could, they could affiliate with uh, and get a say that they're union and negotiate uh, a contract with the management. So it's still possible for them to unionize if the unpaid wa workers want to organize. Uh, but the NLRB uh, is, uh, uh, I would say, a pro-corporate organization, even though sometimes it does rule for workers, and they voted against the right of all workers to be in that union. So that's what happened at, uh, at KPFA. 
I don't know if other people want to comment. Okay. Yeah. Not on that specifically, but maybe um, to follow up on what you had said about the Huffington Post, and you know, the ironic thing is that a lot of labor news gets put out through the Huffington Post because it does have such a wide readership, and the, you know, the Citizens Trade Campaign has some good articles on there about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, you know, trade agreement, and there. I think even Richard Trumpet from AFL-CIO had an article on there. So people use it, you know, as a platform, not thinking about the fact that they're exploiting the freelance workers. Just a couple of other examples, the AOL also has this thing called the Patch, which are these sort of hyper-local news websites. And I've been uh, at the Black Friday event in San Leandro at Walmart. There was quite a few young reporters from Patch there. And these people are they're young, they're very enthusiastic, they're hardworking. They do a pretty good job, and they seem to be really interested in covering labor. But whether they're getting a living wage doing that, I really don't know. So that's something that people should consider: is how to so how to find. All, I mean, some of the, the the media websites like Bay Citizen is another one in San Francisco that was initially funded by Warren Hellman and now is affiliated with the Center for Investigative Reporting, and they actually do have some good reporting on there. And I, I'm not sure if they're a union or not. But there's different hyper-local news websites which, if there's active labor, labor union activity in that locality, they will cover it. But whether they are able to pay people or exploit people or give people just a, you know, an entry-level unpaid job that they can use to jump into something else, I'm not sure. But there are funding mechanisms that they're trying to find either through grants or private foundations to support those kinds of endeavors. Yeah, the, the base citizen, I think, uh, is uh, voted down the CWA. Okay. The, the Chronicle workers, by the way, are in negotiation for a contract. The Hearst Corporation is attacking their health care. Uh, so th that's what's going on. I mean, the other thing is the CWA, and I think it would be a good thing for the CWA to do, they could set up a journal like the Huffington Post, and they could have reporters all over the country, the thousands and thousands of reporters who've lost their jobs, write for that and try to build it up as a news source and fund and take care of their members. So that would be a vehicle to actually support their members and get these writers in a news service, a news provider. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, you know, the Guild, Newspaper Guild, if you go back uh, many decades, did have a tradition in long strikes in certain communities of. Uh, creating strike papers. Uh, there was a, an alternative newspaper that was launched in Detroit during the long Guild and Teamster and other union struggle against the free press and the Detroit News, but it didn't really survive the strike. And, what you know, as called? people got... What was it called? The Detroit Metro. It was a weekly. Yeah, weekly yeah. But it built up a pretty big circulation initially when it had, um, you know, people who had been um, turfed out of their professional journalist jobs producing the content as they left Detroit, got called back to work. Uh, you know, it was harder and harder uh, even with union subsidies to keep that going. Now, the, the web version of this obviously is, is lower cost and there should definitely be more experimentation. But, you know, I think it's kind of hard to have a hard and fast line about, you know, paid or not paid. I mean, a, a lot of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, of uh, the publications that we would support, for example, Labor Notes, uh, you know, a lot of uh, the work is volunteer work. Local union activists trying to tell the story of their strike, their organizing campaign, their local union reform uh, a struggle, you know, send in a report. They're not paid. The five or six full-time people in the two offices they maintain in Detroit and uh, Brooklyn are paid. They're full-time. They don't make much. They're guild members. Uh, but other people contribute their labor uh, because, uh, you know, it, it's seen as a, as a political project. Uh, somebody like Mike Elk, who's trying to make a living as a freelance journalist, says, no, I'm not going to write for labor notes because I'm not going to be paid. And Dave Baker would make the same decision. So that's understandable. But I think, you know, we have to distinguish between where the Orient Huffington situation, where somebody's making a lot of money off a publication and not paying people, and others where people are, in a sense, contributing their labor because it's something they do as, as an extracurricular union activity or, or, or political activity. I mean, my advice to anybody who's a budding freelancer in this field is don't quit your day job, and you're going to need one. <laughs> I mean, I, I did my first opposite editorial page piece for the Boston Globe in 1981. It was about the Patco strike. I got paid $150. I did my most recent story for the Globe uh, on the op-ed page about the 100th anniversary of the Lawrence, Massachusetts strike back in January of this year. Guess what I got paid? 
dollars. <laughs> now, hasn't the Boston Globe ever heard of something called inflation? And I'm supposed to consider myself lucky because they didn't say, well, we don't have room for you in the hard copy edition. We'll run it uh, on bostonglobe.com, and guess what? We don't pay anything for that. So, I mean, notwithstanding the great struggles of the NNU all of these years on behalf of freelancers, the Globe, and other publications, the trend line is not positive. And uh, the more they push content onto the online side of their operation, where it's the Globe or the Nation or whatever, the more they get into this, we're not going to pay you because we don't have to because we have so many people who will want to write for us for nothing. So I think you've got to be realistic and flexible about it. And I have the greatest respect for people who draw the line because they're still trying to make a living out of freelance earnings. But it's very rare to be able to do that without supplementing that with kind of uh, work for hire as a writer or teaching or a part-time job working for as a communication person for publication or, or you know, any kind of other source of income. You're going to need it. By the way, just in, uh, information. Labor Tech is organized by all volunteers. Yes, no Labor Tech is a volunteer organization. Well done. So, I want to thank all of you. And, yeah. So I want to thank all of you, and I thank to our panelists who weren't paid for coming here. <laughs> yes. Where's our tech? Coffee. Our time is valuable. Time is money. They got did get coffee, you know, coffee and, <laughs> and breakfast and lunch. So I want to thank all of you. We'll for, send you a bill. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for coming to Labor Tech, and now we wanted to wrap it up with some summary of. Uh,